The girl went to her room after she just disappeared. The police began a search operation using drones, vehicles, and numerous volunteers. After a few days, they still couldn't find any trace of the missing girl, despite all their efforts. On the third day of the search, new details emerged, turning this case into one of the most widely discussed topics in the country, as no one could have anticipated such a shocking turn of events. Afina Strent was born on May 25, 2015, in the small American town of Duncan, Oklahoma. After her birth, her parents got married and her father later moved to Texas with her. Afina remained with her mother, though her father maintained a close relationship with her and visited as often as he could. Occasionally, her mother also took Afina to visit him. Despite the separation, her parents cooperated to ensure Afina spent time with her father. Later, both Afina's mother and father remarried. Afina had two younger sisters with whom she was very close, and she cherished spending as much time with them as possible. Afina was a regular happy child. She always brightened her surroundings with her positive attitude, loved to play, and spent as much time as possible outdoors. At the end of 2022, when she was seven, she moved to live with her father in Texas. She was supposed to stay with him until the New Year's holidays before returning to Oklahoma. During her stay, Afina attended a local elementary school. Her father's house was in a remote rural neighborhood, surrounded by forests and fields, which Afina loved. She enjoyed spending time in nature with her father and had developed a good relationship with his new wife, Elizabeth. On November 30th, as usual, Afina returned from school by bus around 4.15 p.m. Her father and uncle were out at the time, so she was home with Elizabeth. That evening, Afina seemed to be in a low mood and ended up arguing with Elizabeth. Eventually upset, she went to her room and Elizabeth went to the kitchen to prepare dinner. About 20 minutes later, Elizabeth went to Afina's room to call her for dinner but found the room empty. Afina was gone. Elizabeth searched the entire house and checked the yard, but Afina was nowhere to be found. She then called a nearby family member who lived just a few hundred meters away to ask if Afina might have gone to visit them, as she sometimes did. However, they hadn't seen her. After that, Elizabeth called her husband to inform him of the situation. He advised her to call the police immediately and rushed home himself. Elizabeth called 911 around 6.40 p.m., and officers arrived at the house within 14 minutes. She explained the situation to the police and shared her theory that Afina may have run away after their argument. However, her family and friends found this unlikely. First, Afina was only seven years old and had never wandered far from home. Second, it was already evening, and Afina was known to be afraid of the dark. Initially, the police viewed Elizabeth with some suspicion, partly because she had waited 40 minutes after discovering Afina was missing before contacting them. After listening to Elizabeth's account of how she had searched for Afina throughout the entire house and even checked with nearby relatives, the officers concluded that she was likely telling the truth. The police immediately began a search. Despite the darkness, they started combing the surrounding forests and fields within several kilometers of the house. Their main theory was that Afina may have wandered outside, become disoriented in the dark, and gotten lost. Consequently, they focused all their efforts on searching the nearby area. While they did consider the possibility of foul play, they found no evidence to support it. There were no signs of forced entry in the house, Elizabeth hadn't heard any unusual noises or cries, and none of the neighbors reported seeing anything suspicious that evening. The police were joined by Elizabeth, her family, and many other concerned community members. Afina's mother arrived as soon as she learned her daughter was missing. The search continued until 5 a.m., but no trace of Afina was found. The situation was complicated by the challenging terrain around the house, which was difficult to navigate, especially in the dark. By 7 a.m., the police resumed the search with additional officers. As news of the missing girl spread throughout the neighborhood, hundreds of locals joined the effort. Some searched on horseback or using ATVs, while the police deployed drones to cover more ground. However, the search was temporarily halted, as a cold front brought challenging weather conditions. 
After waiting a few hours for the weather to clear, the search resumed, but no trace of Afina was found. Police grew increasingly concerned for her safety as winter was just beginning. Although Texas is in the south, temperatures had dropped to around 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, on those days. Given that Afina was lightly dressed, surviving in such conditions would have been challenging. On the third day, the search area was expanded to a 10-kilometer radius around the house. The police also involved investigators to look into any possible criminal component of the case. Although there was still no evidence suggesting foul play, the authorities grew increasingly doubtful that Afina had wandered off on her own. Over the following days, search teams covered several kilometers in all directions, but they still could not find Afina. The idea that she could have wandered off on her own without encountering any sign of civilization or being found seemed highly unlikely. Investigators then began tracking down everyone who had been at Afina's house that evening. This proved challenging as the house was surrounded by dense trees and set back several dozen meters from the main road, with no security cameras in the area. However, investigators soon got their first lead. It turned out that a package had been delivered to Afina's house by a courier service that evening. The inspectors contacted FedEx, who informed them that the delivery was handled by an independent contractor. Working with the contractor's company, the police identified the specific vehicle that had visited Afina's house. Fortunately, each delivery vehicle was equipped with a surveillance camera. Investigators requested the footage from November 30th. When they reviewed the recording of the vehicle's visit to Afina's house, they witnessed a deeply disturbing scene. The video footage showed the driver taking Afina into his vehicle. Investigators quickly identified the company name on the van. They traced the driver to a 31-year-old man named Tanner Horner and promptly went to his address. Horner was soon arrested on suspicion of murder and brought in for questioning. As soon as the police mentioned that they had video evidence, Horner began to talk. He admitted that he had indeed delivered a package to Afina's house that evening. According to Horner, as he was getting back into his vehicle, he felt a sudden bump and got out to investigate. He claimed he found Afina lying on the ground and realized he might have accidentally hit her with his vehicle. When he approached her, he noticed that Afina appeared uninjured. She was conscious, wasn't crying, and even spoke to him. She told him she would inform her father about the incident. This, Horner said, caused him to panic. Afraid of the consequences, he placed the girl in his vehicle while trying to think of a solution. Afina continued talking, even telling him her name. Horner didn't know how to handle the situation. He feared that if Afina reported the incident to an adult, he could face legal consequences. Then he confessed something to the investigators that left them deeply disturbed. According to Horner, he panicked and decided that his only option was to kill her. He admitted that he first attempted to break her neck but failed. He then strangled her, transported her body to a river near the next town, and disposed of it in the water. Horner's statement raised many questions, but he was able to show the investigators the exact spot where he left Afina. The police immediately went to the location and tragically found her body. The news of Afina's murder shocked not only her family and friends, but also thousands of people across the country. The story quickly spread through the media, and people were horrified by the senseless violence. Following the discovery of her body, Horner was formally charged with murder. While awaiting the medical examiner's report, detectives began to examine Horner's background closely, seeking to understand his motives. The version of events Horner described to the police seemed incomprehensible and deeply unsettling. According to him, he had only slightly bumped Afina with his car, causing no serious injuries. Yet, out of fear, he decided to kill her. Logically, if all he had done was accidentally bump a child without causing trauma, the most he could have faced might have been a minor legal consequence or even a simple apology. This made Horner's story seem highly questionable. Upon further investigation, police learned more about Horner's background. He was married and had a child, and in addition to his parcel delivery job, he occasionally worked for Uber. 
Horner was also involved in music and played in a band that performed at various cafes in Fort Worth. His social media profile showed photos of him with his child, pictures of his musical performances, and other ordinary moments that painted him as anything but a monster. Before his arrest, Horner had no prior issues with the law, and throughout his life, the police found no evidence suggesting he was capable of such a violent act. Just two months before Afina's death, he had posted a photo of himself spending time with his son, grandmother, and uncle. The wait for the medical report, which was expected to clarify what truly happened, lasted several weeks. During this time, the suit was submitted against the delivery company, accusing the company of negligence for allowing Horner to work as a contractor. The case was made to push the company to raise its employee screening and selection standards to help prevent similar tragedies in the future. Then, a heartbreaking detail emerged. The package Horner delivered that evening had been a Christmas gift for Afina. Her parents had ordered her a Barbie doll, something she wished for. When the medical examiner's report was finally released, it only raised more questions. The report indicated that Afina had died within the first hour of her abduction. The examination revealed various injuries on her body, but the exact cause of death pointed to strangulation. However, the main theory of the detectives, based on Horner's account, was not fully supported by the findings in the report, leaving lingering doubts about what truly happened. Investigators initially suspected that Horner might have abducted Afina from near her house with the intent to harm her, but medical experts found no evidence of sexual abuse. This absence of motive puzzled the police as it left them questioning Horner's story. The lack of logic in his account led them to doubt that events unfolded exactly as he described. The investigators then speculated that Horner may have initially intended to harm Afina in some way, but that his plans had gone wrong. According to detectives, Afina might have gone outside into the yard after she argued with her stepmother. Around the same time, Horner arrived to deliver a package and noticed her alone. The noticed location of her father's house, surrounded by trees and isolated from view, allowed Horner to act on his disturbing impulses. He may have either tricked Afina into getting into his vehicle or forcibly placed her inside without drawing attention. What happened next remains unclear. Investigators have two main theories that seem most plausible. In the first, Horner planned to take Afina away from her house and harm her elsewhere, but she may have started screaming or tried to escape. Fearing capture, he killed her and then disposed of her body in the river. The second theory suggests that Horner could have intended to subject her to some form of abuse that didn't necessarily involve physical contact. In this scenario, medical experts might not have been able to detect any evidence of sexual assault. Soon, however, detectives received unexpected information suggesting the crime may indeed have had a sexual motive. Horner had no prior criminal record, which was unusual. In most cases, individuals capable of such violent acts begin with less severe offenses. For several weeks, detectives meticulously studied Horner's background, interviewing his family, friends, and acquaintances to find any hint of prior criminal behavior. Finally, comma, their persistence paid off, and they had a breakthrough. The police managed to locate several individuals who reported that they had suffered due to Horner's actions as children. To protect the integrity of the investigation, authorities did not reveal their identities or the full details of these incidents. It is known, however, that one of the victims accused Horner of assaulting her nine years ago. Additionally, Horner has been implicated in three other episodes involving criminal activity dating back to 2013. It remains unclear whether these accusations involve one child or three separate victims. One of the alleged victims stated that she hadn't been believed all these years. However, after Afina's murder, her accusations have gained renewed attention, revealing a darker side to Horner and potentially providing insight into his motives. Now, Horner faces charges related to four additional episodes, separate from the ongoing court case concerning Afina's murder. There's also a seemingly minor detail that, in light of these revelations, 
paints an even more unsettling picture of Horner's true character. After Horner's identity became widely known, internet users discovered his account on TikTok. The account contained only a few videos, but one of them, posted a few weeks before Afina's murder, drew particular attention. In this video, Horner reacted to a clip in which a man caught a mouse in a cup and then slowly poisoned it from a bottle. As the mouse struggled, Horner's expression was chilling, almost as if he took pleasure in watching the creature suffer. This raised further suspicions about Horner's character. If he was indeed a sadist who derived pleasure from suffering and death, it would cast doubt on his initial explanation for killing Athena, that he acted out of fear of being punished for a minor accident. Instead, his story would seem even less believable if he had sadistic tendencies. As the case proceeded, authorities announced their intention to pursue the death penalty. Horner hired a lawyer, who advised him to retract his confession and fight the charges, but this is unlikely to save him from the full weight of justice. Given that the police have video evidence from the truck and Horner's admission of where he left Afina's body, his guilt seems undeniable. Additionally, when the trial begins, more evidence may be revealed that has not yet been disclosed. It's likely that DNA from Afina was found in Horner's vehicle, and forensic analysis of her clothing and body may have uncovered traces of Horner's genetic material. We will continue to monitor the trial and share any new details with you. Please share your thoughts on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like the video if you found it informative. Thank you for watching.